Hello everybody, my name is Billy Deeroff and this is my panel of On Game, Let's Create. Um, a little bit about myself, I am 29, I have a degree in graphic design and acting. Come on in though, don't worry, it's, it's, a, it's a panel you can jump in any time though. And um, I work at the UPS store and I do stuff like that, but on the side I make board games. So I create my own and I manufacture my own board games. Um, right now, I have two board games that are on the market. I have Fruit Salad here, which I've sold 140 copies. And I literally just got done with my Kickstarter campaign for my newest game, No Honor on Bandits, which has now sold about 50 copies, I think. So, and so it's something that I really like to do, is making board games. And it's something where I played it throughout my life, a lot of board games, and from that it got me inspiration for creating my own games, because, well, it's cheaper to make your own games, well as you can make it more special and something that you like. So, I guess the question is, who here likes board games? Yeah. Perfect. I'm glad everybody <laughs> ran, otherwise the class could be interesting. So, in this panel, I'm going to go through the process on how I made my games and give you a lot of tips and like little things I figured out and experimented with so you guys can create your own board games that look professional. And then I will add a little tips at the end if you want to try to figure out how to sell it and kind of go that route. But at least get yourself a final copy as such. All right. So when you start your board game, you got to start figuring out the concept. What are you making the game of? Is it, and it could be as simple as you like dinosaurs. You want to make a dinosaur game. Or if you have an idea like, I really like Catan's resource building, but I don't have that many games in my closet of that. I want something like that so that I have a game similar. So you got to start figuring out what is your concept. Then you start adding in how many players, how long you want to play it, as well as start figuring out maybe some of the elements. Is it just a card game? Is there a board involved? Is there, is it um, turn-based, chaos, rule, whatever, whatever it is. You start putting down on paper. Get a notebook, start writing everything on there. If you don't like some of it, you can change it. But always get more than less, always great. Then start looking at your, what games you've played. What kind of a game mechanics that you enjoy? Which ones don't you like? Start figuring out, breaking them down into what you want. Game mechanics are not copyrighted. There's no trademark on them. You can pretty much, that's why there's five billion kinds of cards against humanity. Pretty much, it's not. So you can take little ideas from here and there and put them into what you want. Or just put them all in a blender and see what happens kind of thing. So look into it, what is in a game. Once you get there, start establishing your rules. Start figuring out what is the game going to be. How is it going to play? What you're going to need to do and all that. Actually, these are what I do. I do bullet points, and then I start crossing things out that I don't like once I start getting to the playing it a little bit. As well as, like I said, the more is better. And you can also bounce ideas off of other people too, because sometimes people have different experiences, different kind of games they like. You're going to have to play it with somebody, so sometimes it's good to bounce off other people to see what they would like to play with you as well. Alright, once you get a good concept of what your game is, that's when you get to materializing. That's when you start getting your rough prototype of random pieces that kind of help show someone what the game will be, as well as you can actually play it. Um, some of the quick ones that are really simple, um, for cards, obviously flashcards are really good. If you fold them, half cut them. You can make a lot of them, they're easy to shuffle, as well as you screw up or you take too many changes on it, you can always replace it, it won't cost a lot. You can go into the phase of creating on your computer, printing it off, but that's so much work. Definitely, if you change it, it's good to start simple and basic. Actually, these are from a couple games I haven't released yet, so this is a good example of what a prototype is, because that's where those games are at for me. Then, the board. Make it simple. Actually, right here, this is my board for I think at least five of the games I have. And all I did was, I just got a giant piece of paper and just draw a color pencil. Very simple. And this is actually the Bandits game. I actually used this for, I think, two years as my prototype. I pulled out this giant piece of paper, get the pieces out, put it on there, and they would play it. It worked really well. You can also do cardboard with paper and tape to it or really anything you want to. Just don't go too complicated, just in case you make changes down the line. Okay, it's good to be attached to it, but don't be overly attached, just in case you start going in the wrong direction. Next, random pieces are perfect for game pieces. I 
absolutely love buttons and beads because you can get so many of them. They're in unique shapes and colors, so you can color code it if you want to. And then random pieces is what I really like too. Just like little figures, maybe Legos are good. Um, some board games that I don't like anymore, I cannibalize. Sorry, Monopoly. <laughs> um, and like, oh my goodness, I think I've killed three life games. And I feel bad, but it's okay. It's now my life. <laughs> so. And then start working on maybe getting collecting pieces of the same colors and all that. And so random things, um, those little beads on there can create one thing, then these beads are a completely different entity. As long as you can tell them apart and people are playing can. If you need to, you can write down a little guide as well if you need it. And actually I'm going to show you something I have. This is actually my game making uh, fishing tackle box because I don't go fishing but I play games so I decided to use it put good use. So this is actually some of the stuff I have in there. I have checkers, I have dice, chess pieces, really anything that can work because who knows what you're going to go to, what idea you're going to jump to. So always it's good to be prepared as well as just look around for anything. Bottle caps is my biggest one. Bandits, the final one is actually bottle caps because I liked it so much when we reviewed the prototype. You can use anything really. It's as long as it's something that's uniform and people can understand. All right, once you get all your kind of general board, cards, rule book, whatever, you get everything you need to start playing it, start playing it. So this is the test and tweak stage, add and subtract. So you play the game, see what works. Are you missing something? Add something. If you think something's a little too complicated, maybe put it on the side, maybe you can bring it in later for expansions, or maybe, it's in, maybe you can use that in a different game. But figure out what you need in your game. You can make a complicated game, but a lot of people don't like to jump into them as often. So maybe you want to start at the beginning and maybe you can add things onto it later as well. So never let anything, about, never let an idea go to waste. It could be somewhere else used. And then see how to play it. Play it more and more and more times. So actually I'm in the military and I actually was deployed last year and I had, I brought with me all my game making stuff because that's more important than everything else I had going on. <laughs> oh man, that was heavy bag, but it was worth it. And so actually, I started testing it. I played the game three, like three CPUs essentially. These are my homies right here that played it. And Machop always would go down fighting no matter how hard uh, you played essentially. So just play it. If you need to play it with yourself, that's fine to get it more figured out. If you have a friend that you can trick into playing with you, that's fine too. But don't be set back if someone says, I'll play with you on this game, and they like keep putting it off, and then you don't get your gameplay that you need. You have yourself. You have imagination. I think everyone here at Nebraska Con has somewhat of an imagination to be here, essentially. Yeah. If not, just watch more anime, you'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> then, once you get to, the, to a certain point when you have kind of a working prototype for the most part, trick friends with food to be game, as game guinea pigs, essentially. Food, uh, spaghetti is a very cheap meal, gets people there, and then they have to play with no. um, It's always good to play with more and more people, because you don't know what kind of experience someone might bring. They might break your game, which is perfectly fine. I actually love it when someone comes and plays my game and breaks it, and finds something where I have to write down a new rule, take something out, or rethink the whole game over again. <laughs> Bandits had, even when I was getting to the final stages, someone broke my game again, and I had to figure it out. So it's always good to have more and more people test your game. Okay, now you got that point, you got it kind of ironed out and all that, and you're ready to start making a more finalized piece. These three here are my favorite tools to use for board game making. It's the laser cutter, Cricut, and the 3D printer. Who here has a Cricut? That is a lot less than that. Whose mom, whose parents have a Cricut? Yeah, that's right, that's, that's, it's one or the other, or a friend or whatever. Cricut is my favorite one. I actually cut a lot of my stickers out with that, as well as for the game pieces for bandits. I, it's circles, man. I don't want to do a die cut. I don't want to pay someone to do it. Cricut, it, does, it cuts anything essentially in the pattern. So it's a great tool as well as you can cut cardboard. So if you want to make you know, some really nice cardboard pieces, Cricut's perfect. Um, 3D printer and laser cutter are a little bit more expensive. But the good thing is there's actually a lot of sources out there in the community for you to actually use these things. Um, I imagine, is there anyone here from Omaha? General? 
In Omaha, they have a place called the Do Space, which is a great place where they have a lot of these tools that you can use for free. As long as you pay for, I think it's just the materials. Otherwise, they literally, you just come in, plug your file in and work away. So a lot of these things might not be in your range and you're just making one game and all that, but there's a lot of resources out there that you can use. As well as libraries have a lot of 3D printers for the most part. Or even colleges if you're able to, you know, buy a pizza and bribe a, a lab tech, you can use probably their stuff too. <laughs> it depends. You know, uh, Chris Library has all of this uh, for the community. Just send stuff in to us. See? You gotta connect, you gotta start looking around and figuring out because these tools will help you make it look really nice. For example, with the wood laser cutter, it cuts out pieces, little wooden ones. So like if you were gonna do like, make your own katan, not saying you would, but if you do, it cuts those pieces really nice, as well as the laser can engrave your pattern right on there. As well as all this is up here at the end of the panel if you wanna see some stuff and kinda of get a feel for all of it. Don't, don't be afraid to come up. As well as 3D printer makes pieces really nicely. You get a little more detail with that and more three dimensional. Personally, I like laser cutter because I get you a bigger sheet and wood is a little bit cheaper. And my 3D printer breaks literally all the time, so I go with a laser cutter because I don't want to fix that for the 20th time this week. Yeah. So, all right. Start experimenting. Start figuring out ways that you can make your game look professional or even just look like it's done. For me, like laser cutter, I started cutting out pieces to see what in general what it would look like. Come on in, don't, don't worry. As well as, actually my favorite thing that I experimented was, was with the box actually. So with making a box, it's kind of a pain in the butt with the old way where you have to get a giant piece of paper and you gotta fold it, cut it, glue it and all that. It can work, but it gets really expensive because a big piece of paper costs a lot. You don't want to lose all the money into a game just on the box when you have a lot of things that go inside it. So actually I experimented with stickers, giant gloss stickers. I could put it on there. It looks, I would say, pretty good for the most part, and it's not expensive. It was really cheap. I think I printed on gloss sticker 11 by 17, which is like, I think a dollar, and I got at least one of my big size and a small side on it. So three of that is a box, and that's super easy. But otherwise, experiment. Start figuring out what you can do, what tools you can use to make your thing, make your dream come true. Now, I'm gonna go a little bit into the different elements to show you what I've come up with, as well as it's not the limitation of what you can do, but these are some ideas how to make them. Now, obviously I talked about the laser cutter and the 3D printer, really good tools to make it. But, what about if you want that the really cool looking, you know, pop out cardboard? I found out, um, I don't know which companies do it, but I did know Hobby Lobby does it. They can do dry mount or fusion board, which essentially what they'll do is they'll take your piece of paper that you print off, and they'll fuse it to some kind of a, like a backing, a cardboard of some sort. And then you just cut it out, and that way it will, it will stay on there. And then with a Cricut, you can die cut it, or you can cut it by hand, whatever works for you. That way you can make it look professional and use, and then really easy to use. Also for me, like I said, bottle caps, I found those online. I found a company that sells bottle caps that are un, unused. Perfect, and there's a lot of colors. You can buy chips online or any element. Don't be held back by just gotta figure out what will work. All right. For me, cards is probably the easiest thing. You go to a print shop and they'll do it front and back really easy. That usually costs a little bit the most out of any game I make because a lot of printing front and back takes a lot. But one way I found out how to save money was actually they cut out, but I found out that it costs even more to cut the corners out. So I literally cut the corner by cutting corners by just buying a little machine that presses it save me money as well as it brings me into the game making process. As well as um, with the cards, figure out what kind of cards you like. Imagine you have a lot of games at your house and each one has a little bit different vibe on it. Look at the cards that you like, bring them into the shop. They will find out which paper works for you. There's a lot of different kinds of paper if you didn't know that. <laughs> um, my favorite one to go with is actually linen paper. And I usually do the 100 pound because it's a little bit, it doesn't bend as much, but you can go 80. It's a little cheaper if you want to get a good looking set, but you don't want to go all that way. It's not really that much of a price difference, but it makes a difference overall if you're making a big game. Boards. That one, I think, is probably the hardest to figure out because you're so used to like Monopoly boards. A giant board that opens up, there's four. You can do that route. It's not hard, but if you want to make a lot of them, that's a pain in the butt. Um, with the fourfold, you have to put tape on this side, tape on this side, and then, yes. 
think the, I just came in just as you were switching slides, the previous slide about making cards. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. Very simple. I go to my uh, local print shop and I make my cards that way. Um, I give them the front file, back file, give them a little bleed around that so when they cut it out, it works. Okay, you don't have a little white on it. As well as what I prefer for mine is linen paper and 100 pound because it has that nice texture. It has a little bit of friction so it doesn't slip out of your hands. Not like it would, but just in case. And I also cut the corners to save money on that. As well as, if you guys want, I have cards up here with my website. I'm putting this whole PowerPoint on there, so if you want to look at this, you can go there anytime you want, and even message me for questions and all that as well. So, all right, back to board your players. <laughs> so, traditional board, big board, folds, eh, it's okay. A lot of games, if you see, like, um, uh, I think Cargazon, there's a lot of examples, but like little tiles, those are pretty easy to make. Like, we've kind of gone over that with the Fusion and Cutting with the Cricket. But if you want a big, large board that comes together, it's so difficult and expensive. So find different ways. For me, for bandits, I actually found, I do this. It's fabric. I went to an online custom fabric maker, and it looks good. And the cool thing about this too is, if you can roll it, you can fold it, and it gets really small, as well as it gets really big. With that, I can then even, you just, if I want to do expansion, I just make a whole new board and put it on that too, and it's not that expensive. I buy it by the yard, so I get three boards, I guess, per yard, and it's as long as I want it. So figure out, oh, and I also surge the end so it doesn't get frayed, but that's a little extra work, but it's, the outcome is really nice. Other ways, um, this one is called a game called Empire Builder. You get to build train, go deliver things. I think they have the most clever way that I think will be probably what a lot of people will go to if they figure this out as well as you guys should figure out. Um, essentially what they do is they make a giant puzzle piece, a puzzle thing. It's six pieces, you can do four probably. It's this big thing that folds easily, or you can stack in the game, and you assemble it, you got a giant board that interlocks. That, you can also make on the cricket really easily. You just gotta figure out how to you know, put it on there. But that's one way. Essentially, figure out what works for you. There's a lot of ways to do it. This is just a few ideas, but it gets you kind of figuring out what's something you can do, what can I look into. And then the last thing is the packaging, which is probably the one I hate the most. Packaging is probably the worst, because it's so expensive to get those boxes. If you have a little card box, you probably can use to do that. Like I said, what I did was, I found this nice tuck box, so actually there's no glue involved. It folds in like this, the flaps go in like such, and it's shut. Or you can do the old traditional way, where you have one on top of each other. For me though, I have problems with that because they get really stuck, so I try to find different ways to do that. Um, for fruit salad, I went a different route and actually got a bag. I actually bought these bags. Um, and to get my design on here, I just went to a screen, uh, screen print shop. So go to your t-shirt once. They will screen print on anything I found out. <laughs> I bought them a sleep mask, I bought them a, I brought them a bag to put it on. They will literally screen print on anything, really. So if you find a bag you like that will fit your game in it, perfect. And it's got pretty good detail. You can do multiple colors, it costs more, obviously, but it's a good solution that works. And it's pretty durable and unique. Um, I don't, there might be other ways if you want to get fancier with your, if you're just making one game, get like a wood box, use a laser cutter to engrave it. That stuff works great. It's really anything that can be used to make your game. Uh, generic mailboxes work really well. Yes, indeed. Um, so Amazon has like old mailing boxes. Mm -hmm. Just find one of the right size. They have top boxes. Actually, I think this is called a mailer box. Actually, and this one I got. I think I got twenty four on Amazon for like like a dollar a box or something. Something really simple and easy. It's so much cheaper than the other ways. And it's just another solution. So once you get your game kind of looking good. I go into the next phase personally, and that I think you guys should too, is going to the test or fame or group phase. This is where I literally hand my game to other people and let them play. There's three reasons why I think this stage is the most important. One, it's good to know if you can mass produce. Now, if you're not selling game making one, it's not a much of a problem, but if you ever want to make like four of them, you gotta see if it's actually doable. So this gives you, a, for me, it gives me practice to see if I can make 100 copies. But even making five is a lot of work. You don't want to put too much time into each game. Second, 
it can see if you, they can play your game without your guidance. To play the game with you not there. That's probably the hardest part, to just walk away from it and see if they actually can do it. This is where my friend, this is where a lot of my ideas come from because they'll tell me, complain to me essentially. Which is weird. <laughs> and they all have different playing experiences. Some of them don't like board games. They find something they're like, I like this, didn't like that, fix it. And then, you know, it's a good way to figure out. Yes. So you're saying like give them a board game to play and then get feedback later? Yeah, essentially. Uh, what yeah. I do is I actually sell them the game. Um, I'll make early pro prototypes and sell them and then for like a discount price. But essentially, yeah, just hand it off to someone for a weekend or two, get, like, and then have them like just type up a quick, you know, you know, pros and cons of it, and just go that route. And the last thing is, they will find all the problems in your game, and they will let you know because they think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I want them to break it because if I'm selling my game and there's a big problem with it, I want to know before I do that, before I give out even just four copies of the game. So I let them break it, and breaking is not a bad thing, it doesn't mean you're a bad game maker. Breaking it means that they actually care enough to find a different way to play it, and to mess it up. But, maybe it's actually good things. I have people break the game and I'm like, okay, that's part of the game now, I'll put that in the rulebook as an exceptional thing. Ha ha ha, who's laughing at <laughs> But it's just something where it's a learning experience. Now, your game. You now got everything, all the tools, in your arsenal to figure out how to make your game. Now, if you want to go my route and actually go and sell your game, I'll show you a little bit of that and then we'll open up the questions. So, um, if you want to do what I what I do for my first release is go onto a crowd uh, funding uh, website. These two are the big ones, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Kickstarter is bigger, I think it has a lot of problems. Indiegogo is smaller and has less problems. So you kind of have to figure out how to use it. But I usually do Kickstarter. And how that works is pretty much, you set a goal, you have to make it. If you don't make that in 30 days, you don't get any of the money that's been pledged to it. But it's a really good way to get the game out there so people see it. And for me, it's getting pre-orders. So I can make my big batch, and hopefully if there's a little profit on it, I can buy a surplus, and then that goes into making more games. So it's a really good way to get your thing out there, because Kickstarter is public. Everyone sees it. You know, it's something where I have random people that have bought this game. I don't know who they are. But it's a good way to get out of there. And there's also other things you can pledge on there to help you get your goal. I do like uh, little turn things. Um, I've done that bag. Other things you can add to help you get your goal so that you can make the game. Um, I think that's it. Now your game, go create. How much time do I got? It's 23. Holy crap. supposed to be done. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do this a lot slower, guys. Let's. Uh... Okay. Actually, I'll open up to questions. Um, less a question, but as a side note, yeah. if anybody wants to get like reusable dry erase cards and dry erase boards, you mentioned that the portable boards were hard to make. Mm -hmm. um, they have comics actually has board game making supplies and you can buy a dry erase four fold board for a couple of bucks. That's really cool. I actually bought this dry erase. Um, we actually got a full set of all our game reading supplies at home. Love that. Mostly sourced from Mayhem Comics and a uh, nice kit that they have called the White Box Game Design, which is a game making studio in a box. I like that. Any other questions? That's the one thing I probably have need to start working on now that I'm finally done with the headache of releasing a game. Um, I, it's my favorite style game, is probably the one that has the most rates on it. Um, definitely when I was doing the test family thing, I got a lot of good feedback that I did. As well as I got, I actually, once once you get done with like the Kickstarter phase, you start figuring out other ways to sell it if you don't get into a store. I go to craft fairs, and from there I get also a lot of great feedback on that. But this one's probably the one I get the most on, but this game also is kind of cheating in the sense of that because this game actually invites people to make their own fruit salad games with the pieces in here, and then upload it to our website, and, it, and then we like officially put out a, like an instruction thing for it, and they might even make it into the next rendering of the game. So 
Before that's cheating, essentially. <laughs> like, you get to be part of the process. Of course, you're going to love it. But I've gotten pretty good reviews on both of them, really. Uh, Bandits, I got actually threatened, friendly threatened, by my family to finish this so that they can have a copy before I work on the other seven I'm working on at the moment. So, either way, I, yeah, I, I need to work on the working on trying to get more, uh, uh, I guess, feedback in that sense and try to find more online threads. But that's, it's a hard thing to do because it's hard to figure out where to go and where even people go to go see it to even help you to put the effort into it. So. Yep. Could, uh, could you tell us more about Bandits and where we could potentially give you money for it? Yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, and then also I imagine you guys read the thing that says free stickers. I have a lot of them and I did not know how small the room is, so I have way too many stickers, so help yourself. But um, actually on here, on my website, I have a QR code as well as on this on this card. You can go on there and buy both the games. What I do for selling the games online, I go to I do Wix.com, make the whole website, use the design as well as I pay a little bit to actually use a store on there, so I can sell my games on there as well. Um, as well as actually after this, if anybody here has any questions on the process of making games or even wants feedback on their games, I'm very open to help anybody who's, who has questions or needs to get over a roadblock on that. My phone number and the email is on here. So if you need someone just to run ideas past, I'm open to do it. I will not steal the idea. I'll write a paper, I'll do a video, whatever you want. I have seven games, I don't need another one at all. So um, I'm open to help out as much as I possibly can, even if it's just helping figure out just the little bugs here and just sort of feedback on what, what I think of the idea. I've played a lot of games, so I have a lot of somewhat experience, I guess, but really I'm open to help as much as I can. Yes. So I just want to comment on your uh, thing earlier about leaving the room and letting people play games. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. That is very important because I have found a couple of games off of Kickstarter where the rule books were so unclear that we could not figure out how to play the game that we want. Oh, yeah. So if you are making a game, make sure you have a very clear rule book. If you have a mechanic, literally go through every mechanic and make sure there is an index of each mechanic in the rule book mm -hmm. and pass off to somebody, make sure they understand all the rules without you explaining it first. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them how to play, hand them the rule book and, be, and see if they can figure it out. Oh, definitely. And I if actually, they can, nobody else can either. I think actually another helpful tip, I haven't quite got it to because I'm always really busy with actually my real job and all that, but make a YouTube tutorial of how to play the game. A lot of people don't like reading a book sometimes. It's like a foreign language essentially. With that, make a video of how to play it. Even just like basic rules. Um, on my website, I've been putting, actually explaining the cards because band is very chaotic and the cards, as long as it makes sense, can be used in any way possible essentially. I even put actually, sadly, this is my, I guess, the older edition of it, but on my cards, I'm actually starting to put a little QR code on the top right of it that goes to our website explaining all the cards just in case they don't want to pull out the rule book, as well as being more sneaky, like, oh, I'm just going to look at Twitter, that's what that card does, I'm going to get them next time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something where, yeah, exactly. You want to make sure your rule book is good. Some games, they do not do well. They try to make it too simple, and then they leave out the most important things, and you're like, I have no idea what this works. So with rule books, definitely find someone who's like an English major, or someone who can proofread, have them for free too. They might pick up some words that might be too confusing and help make it simpler. So, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I wanted to know. Um, so once you got to the stage with Kickstarter, um, how much? So my, uh, how much like social media and do you, did you have to do? Do you have any recommendations for like specific places to advertise mm -hmm. your game? Um. I, what I do is I do a lot of Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is all photos, and there's a giant board game community on Instagram. Add a lot of hashtags, it gets more people in the door and see your game. Um, it's also, you can get a really cheap ad on Facebook, which I did for Food Salad, I'm sure. It was not bad, and it got some attention as well. Essentially, the best way to get the game out there is playing the game with other people, new people you've never played with. I actually hosted an event I think it was last Friday or two Fridays ago, where I actually found a, uh, it's called The Game Room, it's a bar in Kearney, and they, I asked them if I could have my game there and play with, play with strangers, kind of, essentially, and tried to invite it, created, you know, some social media, as well as a little bit of, like, um, like flyers put out, 
And we got some people that never, I don't even know who they are, and they came and played the game. And once they see how the game plays, that's when they know if they want it or not. And they had really good reviews for it. So, yes? Did you leave a copy of your game with them so that they could like, continue to play it, or were you just there? It sounds like it's not one of those really cool board game cafes. Otherwise, I would have left one, to be honest. But no, it was one of those where I just put them on the table for them and helped people from there. Um, but if there is, I think, in Omaha, actually, a board game cafe, if you would get a really yeah. full yeah. game, bring it there. Yeah. Even potentially leave a copy with them and leave your information in there if they're mm -hmm. interested in getting one. <clears throat> um, actually, and fruit salad is actually up in, <laughs> is actually in the board game library out there in Nebraska. So if you can play that, it's got eight games in there, and I think we've made uh, eight other ones that are online. So it's on our mm -hmm. website as well. We just keep adding that, but. So it's just a way, more people to play it, more people see it, more people are in So, any other questions? Yes? Do shoe boxes work well for prototype games? Yes, we may. Yes, they do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I use a lot of shoe boxes. <coughs> and uh, lunch meat containers. So this is actually one of my really early prototypes of a game. It's just in this. Um, Bandits was in that for a while. Shoe boxes are really nice because it's an actual box. You can hold it. It won't crush as easily. Um, you steal all my shoe boxes. Yeah, I've stolen all our shoe boxes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'll use half of them, but they're there. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? How do you go about mm -hmm. determining price in the That part's the hardest part. Um, essentially, there's a ratio that you need to kind of have for making your game. It's, I don't go as extreme as like going online, selling it, or going to a store, or like a game store, or all that. But I try to figure out how much the game costs to make. So I get all the estimates. I break down how much for certain quantities, bigger quantities, and all that, and get a general idea of what it is. So I think I think Bandit takes seventeen dollars or eighteen dollars to make, and then so I sell it for thirty-five. So I think it's I feel like it's forty percent. Actually, I think this one's 35% uh, profit, and that goes also, that's not even paying me making these all by hand and all that. So essentially, I would say around 40% uh, of a profit is what you want to aim for, but like, I have 35 on this, and that's fine with me. I think, actually, I think this one's also around 35, so that's kind of my, I guess, good point. Essentially, what you feel like is something willing, another problem with pricing is figuring out what is people so willing to pay for. This is not a $50 game. No one will look at this for 50 bucks. 35 is more reasonable. A lot of your mid-sized games work that way. Fruit salad, I do for 25. That one I have to make it that much because cards cost a lot to print, and I think there's like, uh, like I think 130 cards in there, and that just adds up a lot. That's also why Dominion is also really expensive. It's just all cards. So you gotta figure out how much is it worth and making it compared to selling it, as well as how much someone's willing to actually buy it. So, yeah. Yes? Do you have any uh, strategies for coming up with ideas for games? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, personally, I like getting really, really bored at work, and then my brain starts just messing with me, and then eventually that's why I have seven games I'm working on. <laughs> Essentially, look at, look at your closet of uh, board games, wherever you have them. Look at all of them and see what, and pull out three games you like, really like, boil them down to why you like them. And then just figure out a theme you have a lot of passion for. Personally, I like outer space for weird reasons, which is why we're called Geared Up Gaming Universe. But I like space, I think it's something really cool. So I'm, I might be having games coming out soon where I'm focusing on a couple mechanics I like in a game and throwing it in space to see what happens. Or maybe you like D&D. There's a lot of possibilities with that alone with so many different, either you pick a, a show you like and kind of work a game that works in that sense, or even just, maybe it's just a simple little, like I like my D&D character. I want to make him his own game that is all based on him and maybe something for him. Anything is possible. You just got to figure out what you like, what you want, and just put it together and we'll see what happens. Yes? Expanding on that, you can also drop games in the hat or build a roll table of uh, games you like and themes and uh, oh, yeah. different rules, and then just roll dice to see what you come up with and see how you can mesh it together. 
Oh yeah, right, right. Kind of like a roll for sandwich type deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have one for roll for which fast food restaurant we're going to. There you yeah. go. Yeah, write down game mechanics, write weird themes, put in a hat, draw two, and see what happens. Yes. Uh, earlier you said that you had a list of rules that you write out in the order game, mm -hmm. and you just cross out some of those rules that you didn't like. What are some of those things? Usually it's whenever I'm developing a game and I have a cool idea and then later on I somehow out, I wrote around it so then it doesn't make sense in the game. Um, I have a game that will be coming out, I think it's in the second game that I'm going to be working on. There's a couple of weapon cards that I started reading I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> and so then it's that sense where I, I, there's no purpose for this anymore, it's not a function in there. And so. I have to either rewrite it or just get rid of it and figure something new. So a lot of it is just me working around it on accident and then ending up where I am. <laughs> so, yes? Do you ever just dump out four pieces from different games and just kind of mesh it all together? Yes. Actually, something I'm kind of working on, because of course, you know, you have to have 20 billion projects whenever you're working on anything. <laughs> Um, I actually want to work on, there's an old concept back in the day, whenever arcade games came out, they would make mod packs. Essentially a mod pack is they would make the game add extra levels, make it difficult and all that. So I actually want to try to figure out how to make games different of your classic ones. So I want to make Monopoly into a war game. I want to take, I want to take life and make it into... <laughs> yeah, Monopoly's already a war game, we're getting guns involved and stuff. So. <laughs> But like stuff like that, it's just fun to try to mix it up. Yes? So when you're doing stuff like that, how do you go around publishing it and avoiding like copyright? That is a very good question. That's what those guys got sued for. So it's very difficult trying to figure out the whole legal um, parameters of everything. I've actually had to put one of my games on the, on the shelf for really ever, actually, because I can't do it legally. Um, it has to do with people's names, like celebrities' names, but it's something where I actually hired a lawyer to look into because I didn't want to have a problem down the line. That's part of the testing and tweaking and stuff. And they said, there's a good chance you might get sued by like a few of them. So with that, you just got to figure out, um, you can do law of parity, you can go with that route, or you're just going to have to have things similar but not. Essentially, you have to find the right way to not use someone's image. As well as with certain games, you can't just put, I can't make Monopoly with guns, essentially. That's Power World's whole problem right now. Um, but there's other ways to maybe put that out there as, as an add-on. It's not selling the game Monopoly, maybe it's an add-on. We could probably do it like a Patreon. Uh, Patreon probably is a good way. A lot of people do something like that. Or maybe you find like a subscription thing where like you pay this much and I will give you a couple mod packs for it. There's a ways around it where you're not selling the item, if that makes sense, and that will keep you out of legal problems for the most part. Okay. Um, with, with taking ideas from other games, if you like, for example, let's keep using Monopoly with guns. If you like that idea, morph it into something that is more original if you want to make that its own game. If you like that concept, just change the board, change some of the pieces, what they look like, and then you have a whole different game right there. That also avoids it. Any other questions? Yes? When you're making games, what are your favorite um, starter pieces? Oh, I absolutely love Little little Dudes. My little, where are they? Meeples? See, Meeples is good, but I, I absolutely love my little Penguin Bros. They're, uh, in, that, in that game, they bully people like crazy. <laughs> Hilarious, because looking at the face is not how that works. But oh, I love little figures. Um, some of these are like little warriors in here. I have Olaf, I have a minion, and they'll go to battle and all that. It's just th this is not what I'm selling, obviously. But it's something really fun. It makes people laugh and really connect with it too, because something like okay, I'll be Olaf and I'll go fight something, see what happens. And then builds that connection, and then later on they might get the game. Yes. Is there a site you can go to to find out what? Mechanics are copyrighted. Like you can't use the word cap in your game because of magic, yada yada yada. 
Yeah, so initially the car gave Tim on there's like cranking and uncranking and mm -hmm. just turn it sideways and you know, yeah. it, it, like five billion ways, but it, it, it's, it's kind of, you just can't use the word in your game almost for that mechanic. And yeah. so, you know, you kind of like to know, am I going to be sued for, you know, $10 million for my 35 cent game that I made with beads and sticks? And it's yeah. like, oh, now I'm a pauper and I, <laughs> you know. Um, it's hard to find out what is. That's when a lawyer would come in because they can look at different cases. Like for me, um, for my case, they looked at cards against, cards against humanity being sued for using someone's name. And that was the basis in which I could not make that one game I wanted to make. Um, you have to look it up. I think there's a national database for trademarks. That's what you'd be probably looking at as much. Trademark or uh, copyrights is more of like the logo in which that's, you can copyright that and that's fine. You can't steal someone else's. <coughs> trademarks and patents are a lot trickier because they're a lot more expensive to get them if you want to protect yourself. But there should be a whole library of them out there. You can try to look, but the hard part is finding out what they work really. So that's when legal help is usually better for that. So. Thank you. All right, yes. What if you have an unusual piece that you need for your game? How do you go about getting something like that? That's where it's really tricky, depending on what it is. For example, I have a game coming up that I'm going to have to really start brainstorming about. I'm going to try to probably do it on a laser cutter or a 3D printer gets you really unique pieces. If you don't need a lot of them, that's probably the best way. Um, there's a lot of other ways you can try. You can try making a mold and resin. That's a little trickier because there's a little more science involved. Um, or maybe you, you might even go to someone like a specialist in 3D printing and they can help model something for you or something like that. It really comes down to you just got to figure out what works best for you. What, what, is, what resources do you have at your disposal that you can use to make it? So with that, you just got to think outside the box. And if it's too complicated to make, you might need to refigure it out and so it is a doable way. And then maybe down the line, if you figure it out, then you can replace it. We're at 15 minutes. 15? Yes. Oh, I just really need to put more power on my slides. Have you ever tried the game of math? What? Have you ever tried the game of math? Now? Yeah, in a -O. So it is a unique game in that it is a good starting point to get an idea of what it's like to make your own game. Mm -hmm. Because the, well, it's got a very odd rules. It starts out with a couple of players, and one of the players does not know the rules. It sounds like so, Game Changer, but it's actually a game. Uh, actually, it starts out as a basic game of Uno, but you're not allowed to say Uno. Nobody's allowed to talk. And then once somebody wins a round, that person tells the dealer a new rule that nobody else knows. And everybody has to play by the new rule. If they foul, then they draw another card in their hand. Oh, that's nuts. So the game's rules change as you play, and other players have to figure out what the rules are as you're playing. That's wild. I like that. I know what you're talking about. I've played it before. So it's a great way to experiment with adding and removing rules to a game. I like that. I like that. It's a little complicated, but I like that. Yeah, really that. One last thing I'll leave at this, and if you have any other questions, I would be free to, I'll be up here for a little bit until they kick me out, and then I'll be out there and I'll answer any questions, all that. So let's do not forget, I have a lot of stickers that I need to go with. <laughs> so please help me with that, I got business cards as well. Last thing I'd like to mention, I think I noticed people in the somewhat back row um, from last year, I think once you guys a panel about uh, game jams. Yeah, I remember that. That is another way. If you're having problems with coming in, yeah, you're going to probably hit up Urban Butterflies. But that's another idea in which, if you're having problems coming in the game, they'll give you a premise of a game, of like what to make, and then you have to make it there on the spot. And so it's another good way if you're having a little trouble finding out how to make your game or what you want to make the game of. That's a good way to get started. And it is definitely a gateway drug because that's when you start making 20 million games. <laughs> and then First hit in game design and goes free, then you start wanting game dev kits. And that. Yes. <laughs> actually, another thing, actually, I just say last but um, the final little piece like this, I actually, if you're from Omaha, I go to the Goodwill Warehouse where they sell things by the pound, in which a lot of games go to die. I give them new life. That's where I kill all the life games at. Um, so <laughs> I get a lot of pieces from there, and that's actually probably my main bread and butter to fill the behemoth. So, 
Um, that's just another idea. And as well as if you have any other ideas you would like to me to help you with, just let me know. So with that, I am done. You guys have fun in the world of Nebraska Con and play games, of course. Yeah. Woo! Yeah.